The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on Relationships Matter. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us for this session. We are happy to have you with us. And thank you to those of you who submitted questions at registration. Your questions help us shape our webinars into something useful for you. Should you have questions during the presentation, you can type them into the questions tab on your control panel and we will get to as many as we possibly can. This presentation is also being recorded and will be posted on our website with a PDF of the slides. You should see that up on our webinar page on our website by tomorrow. Today's webinar includes a handout in the handouts tab of your control panel. So we hope you download that and save it and um, have it for future use. I am Mallory Price, training coordinator at Shipley, and I will moderate and monitor your questions today. Joining me is an experienced panel, including Kedrin Dillard, Vice President of Talent at Shipley. She has worked in business development in many capacities. Currently, she oversees all recruiting, talent development, and performance management at Shipley. Kedrin is also on the APMP Executive Committee, responsible for establishing networking and professional development groups within the association. Nancy Eads is Program Director here at Shibley and brings experience in relationship development from various organizations. She is also APMP certified at the practitioner level. Brad Douglas is Executive Vice President of Global Strategy here at Shibley. He has over 25 years of leadership and professional development experience and will moderate today's webinar. So that is us and this is what we will cover today why relationships matter in business development and what that means for us. Then we're going to talk about establishing trust and what that means. So for example, acting with trust building behaviors and understanding the importance of trust. And while we talk about trust, there will also be a video. So be sure your audio is turned up and so you'll be able to see that video. Then we'll talk about networking for success then talk about effective communication and how to ask good questions and what active listening can mean for your communication. And then we will get to a Q&A and try and answer some of those questions, um, time permitting, and then we will summarize and send you on your way for the rest of your day. So with that, Brad, I am going to turn the mic over to you. Okay, thank you all for joining. Thank you, Mallory for uh, getting this all uh, ready to go. Um, those of you who have joined other uh, Shipley webinars, you know that this topic is a little bit different uh, than many that we do, which are a little more on the tactical side around capture management or proposal development. But uh, this came up as a request really from um, many of you, um, our, our clients, uh, especially during this past, you know, 14 to 16 months of of being a little bit limited on how we are able to go about relationship building and so forth. So we thought this would be a really good topic for an hour to talk about uh, relationships, why they're important in in not just business development, but in our business internally as well. So um, let let's start. You know what. Most of us here are here because we're in some way or another involved probably in helping our companies compete for work or win work. And this little model shows where we start. You know, we, we've got to start a pursuit of an opportunity with several inputs. And the first thing we got to pay attention, you'll notice on this this model here as we go around the cycle is we've got to build relationships. Along with that, we've got to gather data, analyze data, develop and implement strategies. Eventually, likely we're going to have to compete by putting together some kind of proposal. Could be a briefing, could be a document, could be several documents. But this is the this is how we, we start to compete for work. Uh, and it's important that we start here. We start with building these relationships and several of your questions that you submitted when you registered were along the lines of, yeah, but you know, how do you do that with the government? 
Well, it's probably more important now than ever before. The government, U.S. federal government, is coming up with new acquisition uh, processes and an approaches. Some of them streamline the acquisition. Um, many of the agencies and departments now encourage more collaboration, not less. Um, so we've we've got to be in tune. We we've got to not hold on to some of the the ideas that we can't talk to government customers. Yes, there are periods of time when they shut it down. Of course, an RFP is released or a solicitation document of some sort might be released and it shuts down communication and so forth. The relationship building has to take place well in advance of that. Um, Kedron, do you have any thoughts here on the importance yeah. as we get started? Absolutely, thank you, Brad. I, I really like this model and I think my first thought is that you're right, the building relationships is the first step, but it, it it's a continuum, right? That's the background. Um, you never, uh, just like in our personal relationships, you never build the relationship and say, okay, that's done, check the box and move on. It is a constant uh, massaging, a constant checking in, you know, do you need anything else? Are we, are, you know, can I, can I provide anything else to you in the sales cycle? When I sold to the federal government, you're exactly right. You, you have to be mindful of, of, of certain timeframes within the procurement process that you, that you can't, um, you know, try to develop relationships within users. One thing that I really took advantage of was that I would ask for referrals from people that were using my product or service within the federal government and ask them, can you let your peer know that this is how you're using my service and this is what's working for you? And that really helped build relationships to the end users outside of the procurement office when I was selling into the into the government. But I think the building relationships part is is an ongoing kind of measure or milestone that is throughout the whole sales cycle, as you can imagine. Um, I'll take the next slide if that's okay. Uh, sure. I think when we talk about relationships and building relationships, there's a soft there's a there's a tactical kind of hard you know skill set that's required in building relationships and there's also more of more of a soft skill set um, you know to develop those interpersonal skills so you know tactically it's it's the logistics it's the scheduling it's the it's the summarizing meetings after it happens it's if you say you're going to call your your prospect or client at a certain period of time you do that it's 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 those are the tactical skill sets that build a relationship. Um, but there's also being an active listener and communicating and um, trying to problem solve or being two or three steps forward or in front of your client to try to help them do their business better, to really consult with them. That, uh, that goes into, you know, a, a, a solid relationship um, with, your, with your end user um, or your potential end user. The next slide talks about uh, the reality, the new reality of in business development, and I think we've all been in a, in a new reality this 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 past year. Um, but I do think, no matter you know, pandemic or not, some of these some of these points uh, apply. You know, customers fundamentally, when I've managed or 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 led sales teams, they buy from people they trust, they buy from people they know, right? And obviously, there's a fine line. And in, in terms of, you know, making sure you're known to your prospects, but, you know, um, when people have money, when, when your clients have a budget and they know your product and they trust your product, that that's when they will, will buy. So keep that, keep that in mind. They buy from people that are, that are, that are consultants, if you will, strategically, you know, that, 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 that feel that they are a partner in, in their business. Um, people want to get, customers want to get the best value. Um, uh in 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 their in their purchases and that value can mean different things to different end users or different prospects that could mean price that could mean efficiency that could mean you know length of a contract term you know all of those things uh define what value means but you want to know how does your prospect define value um you know the seller who understands you know hot buttons uh of, of the prospect typically uh, wins the business and that's just not solving for those hot buttons in one meeting you want to thread your understanding and a solution for those hot buttons at every touch point with your prospect um, and then obviously you know sellers must sell the way the customer prefers to buy so understand kind of going back to how they define best value 
um, making sure that you're not selling according to efficiency when you know that end user is only looking at the price point and that's what they're going to make their decision on. So making sure the way you value prop or your value proposition of your product or service aligns with uh, the value that that is deemed by your by your end user. Thanks, Catherine. And we're, we'll talk uh, more later. That, that's so perfect because we'll talk later about some different types of customers and, and you know, we're kind of grouping, <laughs> grouping them in groups as we talk through that. But Nancy, maybe I could ask you, uh, you've had quite a bit of experience in the nonprofit area and I know some of the uh, people on the webinar as well probably work in that environment in the not-for-profit. Um, could you comment on that first bullet, just th this idea of, of uh, seeking funding from, you know, to, the importance of trust in that yeah, area? Absolutely. Um, definitely um, building the relationship with donors is crucial to um, getting them to trust your organization and um, the kinds of services that you're providing to the community. Um, so it, it's it's similar to um, the corporate business development life cycle where you've got um, what they call in fundraising cultivation is building the relationship and it can take up to two years sometimes to, to build that relationship with individual donors or foundations in order to um, have a successful ask because they've got to really understand what it is that you're providing and what the benefit is. And there are different types of, just like there are different types of customers and the way they prefer to buy, there are different types of donors and different reasons that they're gonna to give to the nonprofit. So building that relationship and forming that trust is really crucial. Great, thank you. That's interesting. It can take up to two years and, and uh, yeah, these relationships don't, don't grow overnight. Thank you for that. Uh, so let's let's be honest. Um, if we're the seller, if we're the organization trying to solve a customer's problem, there is skepticism out there. You know why is that? Well, here's an example. I saw the most beautiful SUVs in the window of a dealership recently. Nancy, a salesperson came out and said, "Come on in." They're bigger than ever and they last a lifetime. Well, of course, that got my attention until I went inside and later I learned they were talking about the car payments. So why the skepticism? It's because, you know, of our life experience. You know, all of the things we've experienced that make us a little bit on edge and, and as the selling organization, as the business developers, we have to be aware of this, that there's, there's, our customers might be a little bit on guard. So we have to continually, as Kedron said, as, as Nancy has said, even in the nonprofit, years and years, we have to build that relationship. We can't do it unless, unless we really know the customer. So we wanna spend a little bit of time on this, this here. I think that going with that, Brad, on the nonprofit side, your your funders also don't want to be the only donor to your organization. So it's really important to be building that relationship across multiple donors so that they can see that they're not going to be the only one funding the program or the project that you've got that you're doing for the community. So great. So the buyer-seller relationship paradox. Um, we've mentioned this in uh, another webinar. That, you know, it's, it's ironic that we, as the business developers, the selling organization, and our clients, our customers, we want the exact same thing. We want to provide it. They need it. They want it, they want to solve the problem, they want a solution, and they want the exact solution. And as Kedron said, they want the exact solution usually at best value. Not lowest price necessarily, sometimes yes, but best value. So if this is the case, if we both want the exact same thing, 
they have a problem, we want to solve it, we have the solution that they need. Why is it so difficult? Well, it's difficult because of the, I would call it vendor fatigue or frustration perhaps. So why is there often this buyer-seller friction? I would invite you for just a minute, hopefully most of you are at a keyboard, you can go to the uh, questions section, the little questions tab in the navigation window, and why, just type a few words, why is there this buyer-seller friction that exists? Just enter in a few of your comments and thoughts there. Why the friction between us and if it's a government customer, why? Why, why is there this tension? Mallory, can you read some of those off? They're coming fast and furious. They are coming very fast. So timing is off, um, lack of communication, lack of trust or perception that one side is unreasonable or unfair. Uh, lots of sellers, few buyers, incomplete or vague requirements, price point isn't right, skepticism, customer may believe that the seller is purely profit motivated, um, less flexible decision making process. Fear of change. Fear That's of a change. good one. Lots of good things in here. Bias preconception about the competition. Hmm. Overselling and proposal and not delivering in execution. A history with vendors that led to distrust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yes. interesting. This puts me in mind, particularly, um, you know, when I selling to the federal government, particularly going after a recompete, right? And and you know the government, um, you know that the that the potential client has you know has an incumbent in place. Um, a lot of times to try to get through or drive through that friction, if you will, is 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 I said and I've directed my team to say, you know, look, I I know that. I can't talk to you about this, this thing, you know, this potential business after a certain period of time when the proposal goes live. I'm just trying to make sure that, you know, for your time management and my time management that I put the best product in front of you. And sometimes just acknowledging that, look, I'm aware of the timeline. I'm not trying to give myself an unfair advantage. I want to make this easy for you and for me. Um, can we just talk about it? You know, uh, sometimes that's kind of, dissolved any type of friction that I've had with a potential with a potential uh, opportunity or engagement, um, particularly in, in recompete in recompete situations. Great. So yeah, thanks for your <laughs> thanks for your fast and furious input on there. And you know, several of you said been there before, you know. <laughs> and so they've had bad experiences trying to acquire or purchase uh, something. And, and so there's that friction. And then uh, too many of us on the seller side are overly aggressive, assertive, annoying, whatever we wanna call it. So, so we've just gotta be aware and it's the relationship with that customer that's gonna push us through. If they don't know us, this third bullet here, if we're not known to them, it's unlikely they really can trust us yet. And so uh, this, is, this is really important just to understand and admit and acknowledge. Uh, so we put together this, this idea. Of, uh, it's kind of just fun, but let's, uh, there's different kinds of buying styles and what's sometimes hard is when we're selling to well it could be commercial or or government there's often a selection committee an evaluation board right that it's not a single decision maker so we've got to be aware and this was one of your questions coming into the webinar you know we've got to be aware if we can to the best of our ability who these decision makers or influencers are you know, there's these people, type A's, you know, that are just super fast going, 80 mile an hour behavior, you know, nothing's gonna get in their way. There's the road tripper that more, you know, what they're really interested in is yeah, innovation, you know, and they're at a little slower pace. And then we've got the Sunday cruising um, 
buying style, you know, and they're kind of balanced and they, they're going to balance everything out and really weigh it out. Then we got cautious Carl, uh, consistent, reliable, heading at about a 50 mile an hour behavior speed. Then we got this slow and easy, uh, you know, quality over quantity. They're, they're looking at every single detail and they're going at about 40 miles an hour. So we've got to realize the reality is our buying committee is probably made up of a little bit of everything here. Um, Kedron, do you have any thoughts? Yeah. On this? I can't agree. I can't agree more. And particularly on the commercial side, I mean, I think it, it exists when you're selling directly into the government, but particularly on the, com on the commercial side, you know, to your point, you have decision makers that you have to sell essentially to each of them that take on any five of these kind of kind of profiles or characteristics, right? You might have the person in finance that's slow and easy and they want, you know, to just to make the, the, the right decision against the, the bottom line and what's budgeted. You have the end user, so the person that's on the front line using your product day in and day out, that's the highly productive person, right? You know, and then you might have the end user's management team that you have to sell into. That's the one that, that's looking for innovation and what is the solution or service or product that's going to, you know, ensure that my team is cutting edge for the next two or three years. So I think that being knowledgeable that you have any of these personalities that you have to have a value prop for. So what is your value prop for each of these different, you know, kind of profiles, um, I think is the key. And to be able to sell and speak to and position your service accordingly contingent upon who you're speaking to. Yeah, yeah. And and getting back to the relationship theme, um, we can't build a relationship well if we're a road, if I'm a road racer, and I'm a type A, you know, going 80 miles an hour, and my primary audience and influencers are are more of the slow and easy. I can't force my approach on yeah. on the customer. It will, there will be no relationship uh, developed there. So the other the the other concept in making sure as we try to develop relationships with customers what are their decision drivers is it pol politics that's driving this pursuit this opportunity acquisition are they fearful of something you know if you read some of the strategic federal u.s federal government um, mandates and uh, initiatives you know the better buying power and so forth Boy, there's a lot of nervousness that we may be following behind in certain areas of cybersecurity and so forth. So is that what's driving the acquisition? The buying styles we just talked about. We had you comment in the in the questions tab, you know, past experience really is a how they're going to purchase this time. Decision biases they had a bad experience are they frustrated are they losing market share uh, do do they just have pain points that that they need to address financial is that the primary driver and then this one boy this is uh, this is where relationships really come in is if we have a relationship and an open transparent relationship we have the potential to really understand some of the unstated requirements that may give us an advantage, a competitive advantage. Um, and that's why some of these things we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes, being a better listener, asking really good questions. Those are the types of skills and behaviors that build a relationship, that get us to, these, to understand these points better. So it kind of begs the question, we, you know, we always talk about, in fact, Kevin, you know, you know what a discriminator is in, in selling. I mean, it's always usually more on the technical side, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
but maybe maybe we can make the how the how we sell can become a new discriminator for us because the customer feels comfortable they like us yeah they trust us yeah. Yeah, so I think that's engage. a good point. I, I, you know, and takes me back to my days of selling data, right? And, um, you know, particularly, definitely wouldn't offer this to all of my prospects. But um, when I felt like I had a, a sale kind of pending, just on the fence, and if, especially if they were using my competitor, I would ask as part of my close, as a part of trying to close a deal, I would say, what what can I do? How can we put this data in action? So kind of a, a test drive before you buy type of situation, right? And, you know, I would really try to say, you know, look, what is what is the next time you need data? And let's do a head to head comparison between me, you know, this the data I'm selling and the and the incumbent, right? Or or the data that you are currently using, right? And and you know, I, I would ensure that it was sanitized and, and above board, but but that was my way of showing the product. It was my way of showing partnership by way of, look, I, I can better understand your business as a result of, of trying to partner with you in this way. And it in inevitably deepened the relationship. Even if I didn't get the business, they truly felt as I was going kind of above and beyond to try to, to try to help them in their, you know, kind of in their, in their business. So I think the how is incredibly important. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. And then customer engagement. So if our goal is to gain trust and earn respect from our prospective customers or existing customers, just a couple of ideas. We'll, we'll talk more about this later. A couple of guidelines here. We've got to be ready. Uh, we've got to be ready and be thinking and on our, our A game anytime we have the potential to enter into a discussion, an engagement, a call, uh, a, a web conference, we may only get one chance. We need to be thinking ahead about what kind of questions or discussions do we want to have when we get a chance. We may only get one chance. And then this concept of peel the onion back, we'll talk about that, active listening, follow-up questions, getting to the underlying issues, and then we're gonna talk about active listening, the idea of clarifying and listening some more. These are, I know these sound simple, but, but we just sometimes aren't doing a very good job of listening. So trust, let's go back to this idea of trust. It improves the relationship and how do we become a, a trusted advisor? Uh, we've, we've got to be in this answer actually a few of your questions you submitted also early on too. We got to be proactive. We can't be sitting back hoping the customer reaches out to us. So we've got to be proactive, uh, relevant. If we're, we've got a reason to call a client or a customer, we've got to have a reason and it's got to be relevant. And customers are always looking for innovation. Be visible and establish this trust with a consistent message. Be a valued resource to the customer. Kedron, you hit on this a little bit. Do you want to expand on that just a little more, this idea of being a resource to your customers? I, I just, you know, I, I just think, and as I said, it's, it, there's no better way to understand your customer's business, understand um, the ecosystem that your customer sits in. So you're understanding your customer's business, you're understanding customers that are similar to that, that prospect, their business. Um, but, but, you know, by really trying to, and showing that you're rolling up your sleeves and saying, look, even before you buy this service, and again, you have to measure this and you have to, you know, do this only with the, you know, prospects that you see in ROI is in striking distance, if you will. But, but there's no there's no better way to sell and to nurture a relationship than to be a resource, you know, throughout the selling and closing process to your to your client. So I, I can't stress that I can't stress that enough. Good, good. Stay connected. You know, if you've got white papers, news releases, press releases, uh, product new product demos, uh, testimonials, and things, just um, stay connected with. 
this all builds relationships. Use multiple channels. Some of us, you know, depending on our generation, we might be a little leery uh, of some of the social media and the ways to, to connect with people. Um, we shouldn't be. We, we should be smart about how we use it, but some of these ways to reach out and connect with people are amazing if done well. We don't want to become an annoyance to the customer and destroy the relationship that way. Okay, um, speaking of being a resource, I want to just mention, um, if this is an issue in your organization or in your ability to engage with your customers, trust, if, if that's an issue, uh, Stephen M. R. Covey, who I, I've quoted here, um, he runs a, a training consulting practice that he is, is called the Speed of Trust. Uh, Stephen M. R. Covey and I are friends. Uh, we worked together uh, for a few years, um, collaborated together, and uh, this I'm using this information totally with his permission. But here you see, trust is not merely a soft social, social virtue. Rather, trust is a pragmatic, hard-edged, economic, and actionable asset that you can create. We can create this trust. We can build this trust. There is a compelling case for trust. Teams and organizations that operate with high trust significantly outperform teams and organizations with low trust. So I invite you to think of your own organization, your own teams. This has been proven in dozens of studies across multiple industries and sectors, this idea of trust. And it, it works inside of organizations and it absolutely works external when we're reaching out to customers. So what I've done, I've pulled out in the handout you have, uh, you, I hope you'll take time to download it. Um, it talks about uh, the 10, 10 elements uh, and benefits of, of the speed of trust. So here's a few of them. I won't go over them because they're in the handout. Uh, I won't go over them in detail. Uh, but trust, the engine of the sharing economy. Change is the new normal. We know that. Trust itself has become a key strategic initiative. Who are we going to be able to recruit to come to work for our companies if we ha can't establish trust? And if they don't sense that it's a culture of trust. Yesterday's style of management, insert selling, it's insufficient for today's environment. Trust has become a much bigger factor than ever before. So a few excerpts from uh, uh, The Speed of Trust, uh, Stephen uh, M. R. Covey's book and, and uh, his information. So what we'd like to do is show you a, uh, a short video um, because the first bullet point on the last slide says it's something we can develop. We can develop trust. And so we wanna just show you a short video on some of the behaviors that actually demonstrate trust and so go ahead and turn your audio up if it's if it's low and we'll go ahead and play this video and then we'll come back and we're going to talk a little bit about networking the importance of networking to establish relationships and a little bit about active communication active listening and so forth so let's uh let's go ahead with this video
Okay, a uh, lot to take in there, um, but uh, we can, you know, we can get better. We can, we can get better at building trust. Um, and uh, before we move on and talk about networking and the power of networking to establish relationships, build relationships, I wanna address a question um, that, that was uh, submitted in the box here. Uh, how does my organization gain trust without being able to reach the customer? How do you get past the first line of defense, the, the contracting officer? Well, let's just all acknowledge, sometimes you can't. Um, and uh, the only way we can, we, can, we can just keep trying without, I keep using the word being annoying. We, we can't, uh, keep trying the same way to get to decision makers and influencers. We've got to try some different things, whether, uh, but it, it's hard. And when, when, when we don't have an existing relationship or trust with a customer, especially in the federal government, that sometimes is restrictive, it, it's just flat out hard. There's, I wish I had a, a silver bullet answer for that. But uh, going back to what we talked about, we've got to be relevant. We've got to be credible. We've got to have a reason for them to want to listen. If we're just another vendor knocking on their door, then there's vendor fatigue and we won't, we won't uh, get listened to. But that's, that's a tough one. And I, I, I sympathize with that challenge. Okay, uh, Kedron, you're, you're so um, good at this and have such great background in networking um, to establish and build on relationships. Would you mind talking us through a few of these key points here? Of course. Um, I think back to leading into networking, back to the question of how do you get through or, or by the gatekeepers, um, the, the, the procurement specialists, the contracting officers, sometimes it's through networking. I mean, to your point, Brad, there's, there's not a silver bullet, there's not an answer, but through, through networking, I've been able to find, you know, um, an end user or a potential person that knows an end user, you know, um, and, uh, you know, it might take, it may, might take some time, but, but that's one of the many beauties of, of networking. Um, just, you know, just not to, you know, as, as, as the slide states, not to underestimate the power of always trying to build relationships, uh, you know, as we, as we drive through our, our sales process. Um, the benefits of networking, right? You know, virtual or in person. And I tell you, you know, for those of us that have been lucky enough to maintain employment through the past year and a half, you know, you've had to learn how to uh, be um, function to function in a virtual environment. It goes without saying. Um, uh, but the benefits of networking is to boost your brand's awareness. Um, you know, we talked about differentiators uh, earlier. So to really differentiate, to, to have the ability to differentiate your service or offering against your competition, um, to validate, to validate claims, to just increase visibility. As we said earlier, you know, customers buy from whom they know. Uh, I had a mentor that would say, you know, when I have budget, I want to you want to be the person that they know they could pick up the phone and 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 say you know look I'm ready and that that takes visibility that takes uh, without being annoying Brad to your point that takes you uh, getting to know your customer and then getting to know you um, improve credibility you know with is another benefit of networking um, it goes without saying that could be done through thought leadership that could be done just, just knowing the ecosystem the space as to which your clients and prospects play um and just overall gaining gaining trust by sharing sharing relevant information as we as we stated stated earlier um i i think another bullet here um to to mention that that networking allows you to control the narrative right you know there there's plenty of times where you know i'm networking my competitors are doing the same thing right and if they're doing their job well they're poking holes they're telling the same clients this is why you don't want to go with said product or said service right and and so not that you want too much energy or time spent in kind of ghosting verbally ghosting your competition but you want to be able to control that narrative you want to be able to repeat to repeatedly 
state what your value prop is, right? And not 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 lie dormant and allow your your competition to kind of uh, to kind of share, you know, why they don't want to purchase from you. So that's just one one of the many additional benefits of 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 networking. Um, Kevin? The types of networking, please, Brad. Yeah. Yeah, just real quick. I, I want to, yeah. um, because of some of the questions that have been uh, coming sure. in, um, I want to put a plug in here for conferences, trade shows, and this this includes virtual. Uh, this doesn't have to be yeah. face to face. Um, AUSA events, uh, you know, industry days, and all of those. If if we're looking for ways around a contracting officer, right. that's one of the ways. And if we're just showing up at those events to just show up and be a silent observer, we're missing the mark. If it's a live event and we have potential prospects and customers at that event, if we're going without some kind of pre-introduction, and just hoping we find them there at their booth or you know in a conference or a breakout session we've missed completely missed the mark those events have agree. to turn into networking events i can't agree more and i i tell you something that it, it's taken a little bit more work but in this virtual environment we've been in i mean i i would i would say the conference uh planners have been more apt to say you know let me send out who's going to be in attendance ahead of time, right? And you take those lists and you reach out ahead of time to your point and, and ask or, you know, I see you're gonna be in attendance or even if you don't see a prospect on that said list, it's a great reason to reach out, right? And then say, I'm gonna be attending this conference. Do you know about it? Are you attending? Um, can I get some time, you know, but, but, but back to the, this past year and, and the virtual space we've been in, it's been, you know, the ability to connect with people that are also virtually attending these conferences. It, it was, if you didn't take advantage of that, or if you still don't try to take advantage of that in the immediate future, I think you're missing to your point, Brad, a, an opportunity to connect. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the types of, of networking. Yes. Please, I'm I, sorry. I was just going to say, <laughs> some of the training classes that we do, um, you yeah. know, we, we get uh, people from different companies coming into our training workshops, and the amount of networking that takes place in oh, that geez. two or three day workshop, sometimes they're finding customers or teaming partners, you know, th that are going through the same training class or the same event. And so, don't forget about the idea of letting networking uh, help you find potential teaming partners as well. That's a very important part of, of networking. I, I think one of the values sometimes of going is, is, is who you meet, you know, outside of those of, of the companies they're representing, right? And and if that, if, to your point, if that's not taken advantage of, you're you're definitely missing missing an opportunity. I won't spend too much time on this slide. Just the different types or the different buckets of of networking to build relationships. It could be from a learning and development perspective. Um, it could be from an individual interest perspective. What is a hobby? Are you into the arts? Are you uh, into, I don't know, your, your kids' uh, athletics? You know, how do you network in those spaces or what organizations or how do you become more involved in those spaces in addition to, as we've talked about here, the customer seller uh, networking kind of bucket, if you will. Um, examples of network groups uh, on the next slide. We all know the social platforms, so your LinkedIn, your Facebook, your, your Twitter. Um, I tell you, Twitter, you know, following your company uh, or your prospects on Twitter, not, not by name, but their, their, their organization, um, organ, you know, their, maybe their, their space. It's, it's some good nuggets that come out of that, that just if nothing else, uh, you know, are, are good talking points when you're potentially when you're in front of uh, your client, not necessarily the gossip and the fodder, but, but, you know, you'd be surprised how many clients are active or, or prospects, I should say, their, their, you know, PR or communications team are active on Twitter. Um, so okay. I, I, I definitely encourage you to take advantage of that. Yes, please, Nancy. Oh, I was just going to jump in and say that I think when you're leveraging social media really well, 
it's getting to be more and more a space where people expect to see you telling your company story. And it's a place where you can really boost that brand awareness and sort of differentiate yourself from competitors that may look the same if, if customers are just looking at your websites and you have similar language or, and if you're using those platforms really strategically, um, then there's also a way that you can um, incorporate, you know, shout outs to your customers and help highlight things that they're doing as well. Great point. I agree with you completely. Yes, please, Brad. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, I think one of our, our company's best networkers, um, uh, he, uh, he, really, he does an amazing job. He, he gets on um, client uh, shareholder calls and, mm -hmm. and listens to what the executives of his client companies are saying on these, these publicly broadcast uh, shareholder calls because they're going to convey the most strategic directional information possible. And what a great way to, to network, to be become aware of what the executives of your client organizations are thinking. So Kedron, thank you for this. I mean, there, there's a lot of ways to network and, and we've got to pick and choose, but not be shy. You know, about it. I would also just say really quickly that one of the things that maybe we didn't have on that slide is leveraging relationships with the leadership in your company. If they have a relationship already with one of the influencers or decision makers at a company where you're trying to make inroads, they might be able to help make that introduction for you so that you're not cold calling. Great point. Yeah. Great idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this, uh, this, last short segment we want to talk about when it comes to building relationships and we sometimes take this for granted you know um, we take communication classes in college and you know learn how to communicate but how do we really communicate to really build and grow relationships well the first thing is most of us I'm not saying all most of us have to be better listeners you know, we 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 are too anxious to jump in and talk, 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 and especially in a business development mode, um, our prospective customers are tired of hearing sales pitches and statistics and features and dimensions. You know, they want to talk. They want to talk business, and they want you to listen. So just a couple of active listening listening guidelines. These are these are basic, but pay attention to the what, the how, and the why of the message. Why is the customer telling you what they're telling you? Is there some kind of um, tip that they're giving us? You know, a directional idea that would help us maybe win the work. They want us to win the work. Interpret what is said and the intent. Uh, try to figure out what the intent behind the message is when we're listening. Respond to what we hear. Acknowledge the message. Restate it. State it somewhat differently. Make sure we understood. Acknowledge the message. Be present and ask for clarification. Um, oh, so for Nancy, so do I understand this right? that you're looking to increase the frequency of your marketing reach in your program. Did I, did I get that right? So clarification is so important. Passive versus active listening. It's the active listening that builds the trust. Active listening is clarification. Passive listening is we're constantly just sitting there trying to interpret uh, what they say. We, we don't want to interpret. We want to clarify and make sure we got it right. So what is clarification when we talk about active listening? It's stating what you hear or see, sense is happening in a neutral way. We're not being judgmental in the way we clarify. We're not putting the customer on the defensive. Clarification is not feeding back advice. 
since clarification means being neutral, we hold back our opinion or our reaction to their messages. We don't get into a, a bantering. We just want to clarify what we heard. So clarify when, when we want our customer to feel more understood, when we need to uh, know that we understand. They want to know that we, we understand. Restate what we heard, change it up a little bit, but don't change the meaning of what they said or content. Get to a point with the customer where you, we can make it conversational, not scripted. Don't add a bunch of thoughts or opinions. Don't ask questions when you should be just clarifying. Clarify in three ways. Uh, verbally, auditory, visual, and point, gesture. Go to a, a, you know, a, a whiteboard, to make a note. Um, so make sure we're actively listening by clarifying what we've heard. Now we're not going to go through. if I can quickly, yes, please. If I can just quickly add one other, just finite point there is sometimes clarifying is by way of after you leave the meeting and it's a summary, right? You know, as, mm. as fundamental as that sounds, it could be clarifying by way of a summary email to your point, not adding any kind of next steps, but just this is what I've heard. Just want to ensure we're aligned and put some put some you know concise bullet points in the email. That's I've used that many times and 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 attempt to clarify. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Summary. Did I get this right? Yeah. Right. So we're going to uh, not go into all of these. This is this is information you can go back and look at. You can you can see it in the PDF of the slides. But these are some specific types of, of question. If you're looking for a little brown bag session for your team that maybe is uh, customer facing, uh, and they're having a hard time figuring out what to ask or say to the customer. These are different types of clarifying questions that we can ask. Open-ended, um, you know, not confrontational, making sure we're creating a business dialogue going forward. So we'll let you look at those examples uh, uh, after the webinar. So just to wrap up, um, just from Stephen M. R. Covey, this little quote off to the left, you can ignore the principles that govern trust, but they won't ignore you. Uh, trust is really, really important when it comes to building relationships. So relationships do matter in business development. We can't just be a commodity, uh, uh, you know, uh, order taking, organization and expect to grow and win strategic deals. Uh, establishing trust, we can think about those behaviors that create a trust environment for us and our organizations. Networking is uh, really, really important to build business relationships. Communicating effectively, the key points there ask good questions, ask clarifying questions, and be active in the way we listen. Um, so let me just pause. Mallory, are there any questions that um, have been submitted that you think we ought to try to address in the last minute or two? Uh, yes, there is one. Um, do you have any suggestions for getting one-on-one -on -one meetings at virtual conferences? I always ask questions to get noticed, but never get the one-on-one. So do you have any suggestions to help them out? The only suggestion I have, and this, this sounds kind of, um, well, it's meant to be nice. We've, <laughs> the customer has, there has to be a reason they would want to meet with us. We yeah. have to be relevant to them. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're unknown, and irrelevant, they don't want a one-on-one. -on -one. And I know that's hard when we're trying to break new ground, when we're we're trying to build a relationship and they just won't meet with us. There's no easy answer, but anything we can do to be relevant, intriguing, establish curiosity, sometimes that will get us a meeting. Oh, wow, I'm curious about that. You say you do that? Oh, I am curious. So curiosity, mm -hmm 
innovation, something intriguing. Uh, Kedron, do you have any ideas? Yeah, uh, I think from a more tactical perspective, start early. The earlier you can request a meeting, you know, leading mm. up to that event, the better. And I and I think you got to look just like you're trying to get as many meetings they are as well. So if you don't have anything that's new and cutting edge, say I need five minutes. I just want to introduce myself, exchange business cards if people even carry business cards these days, and and that's it. But 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 sometimes that will get you a yes. You know, over over you know, I want to sit down and give you a complete demo of my service or, or product, right? And then you could do, but you could do that later after the conference. So yes. those are my top of mind to to suggested points. There was a question submitted uh, in advance, and I, I'll just really quick. We're we're at our end here, but uh, does protesting hurt your relationship for future opportunity? This is a great question. Uh, yes or no to protesting. So I'm not going to give a yes or no answer <laughs> because it's too hard. But protesting too much uh, can uh, damage your relationship. Let's let's acknowledge it. Um, evaluators of proposals are human. Um, decision makers are human, and there are top tier government contractors that have a soured reputation in certain federal government agencies because of this very fact. They know that this company, if they're not awarded, are going to protest. And if that's the kind of reputation you've built, it's not a positive one. Uh, I would also say on that, Brad. Go ahead, oh, please. Sorry to interrupt. I would just say that um, instead of maybe protesting depending on the situation, it might be better to apply that time and attention to the white hat review and the lessons learned and, and how are you going to move forward? Good. I can't agree more, Nancy. You can ask for a debrief. Like you can ask for a debrief from the point of contact and sometimes they will provide that to you, you know, and you could do that as opposed to a formal protest process, right? Um, but, but I agree with everything you and Nancy are saying, Brad, that you want to be mindful of, of the frequency and, and what you want to get out of that protest before doing so. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Nancy and Kedron and Mallory and all of you for joining. Uh, we'll, we'll do a, our next webinar will be in August. Proposal myths, facts or fiction. And um, again, thank you for your time and your input. I uh, hope this has been helpful and uh, look forward to uh, meeting up with you again in a future webinar. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.